Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Professor Cheryl Knott from Boston University, and welcome to Boston University's Dialogues in Biological Anthropology. These dialogues were developed by Kay Brown and, and Matt Cartmill and are run twice a year. And what we do is we bring together experts from biological anthropology on different, uh, with different topics with different points of view. And we try to have a discussion and discuss those, uh, those issues and the current issues of the day. So today our topic is babies, brains, and bipedality in human evolution. And we have with us Professor Stephen Churchill from uh, Duke University and Professor Karen Rosenberg from University of Delaware. And at 2 o'clock this afternoon, we had a very stimulating live webinar, which hope many of you were able to see, um, which we discussed the relative importance of uh, bipedalism versus obstetrical constraints in the evolution of the human pelvis. So trying to understand how we got from some kind of an ape-like pelvis like this to a human pelvis and the relative um, importance of childbirth versus locomotion in the evolution of these of the human pelvis. So I'd like to start with uh, Dr. Churchill. It's going to give a little summary of uh, some of his points that he made in case you uh, missed those this afternoon. Uh, thanks, Cheryl. So uh, for those of you who missed the, the, um, the webinar, in um, a nutshell, Basically, what I pointed out was that if you look at the pelvis of an australopith, so this is a reconstruction of Lucy's pelvis, it's about 3.2 million years old, um, you can see that there are some, uh, first off, important differences from a chimpanzee. It's a lot shorter from top to bottom, and uh, the iliac blades are a lot wider. And pretty much everybody says, yeah, that's, a, that's about bipedalism. This is a pelvis which is adapted to walking on two legs. This is a quadruped when it's on the ground. But there are also differences with modern humans. Um, and there's much less disagreement about what these differences mean. You know, the modern human pelvis, uh, or that of any member of the genus Homo, for that matter, has more vertically set iliac blades, and they're more curved, and the pubis is rotated upwards, and there's greater buttressing. You know, the, the, the pelvis is more robust in places. The ischium is shorter. And some people basically say, well, that means that there's a locomotor shift between the australopiths and the genus Homo, uh, that the australopiths were maybe still climbing trees, and they, they um, were walking bipedally when they were on the ground, but because they had to have morphology, which was good for climbing trees, they're walking bipedally in a different way. You know, they're, they're like groucho walking. They're walking on a bent hip, bent knee. And once hominins came fully down from the trees it, with the genus Homo, uh, no longer did we have to have selection favoring morphology, which was good for both bipedal walking and climbing. And um, uh, selection could sort of improve the hip for bipedal locomotion, and we get the, the genus Homo type pelvis. So that's one argument. Uh, the other argument is that Lucy was a great biped, and uh, that this pelvis is perfectly adapted, or maybe not perfectly, but very well adapted for bipedal locomotion, and that what happens with the genus Homo is our brains got big, and that requires a larger birth canal, and you know, given that the, the size and shape of the overall size and shape of the pelvis is kind of constrained by certain things, you have to change the architecture of the pelvis to get that larger birth canal. So that's kind of uh, a longstanding debate in paleoanthropology. And the rest of my talk was saying, well, we got some cool fossils from South Africa, um, which were just, we named a new species last year, Australopithecus sediba. And uh, we see in the pelvic material from them a lot of the features that we see in the genus Homo. Uh, so there are a lot of sort of derived features here. But this is a small brain species. Here's a cast of, um, of the type specimen of Australopithecus sediba. And uh, he was about 11 to 13 at the time of death. His brain was only about 420 cubic centimeters. Um, if it were, were to grow any more, it could be at the adult size by that age. If it were to grow any more, it would only get up to about 440 cubic centimeters. And that's on the low end of the range for the Australopiths in general. So we're seeing changes in the hip in the direction of the genus Homo without brain size expansion. So my point is that kind of indicates that there are some problems with the obstetric model. And I think that doesn't necessarily mean that it's, it's a locomotor shift, but it kind of throws a lot of weight to the idea that there is some kind of change 
in locomotor dynamics um, between the Australopithecus and the genus Homo. All right, thank you. Dr. Rosenberg. Um, so I'm interested in paleoobstetrics um, and paleopediatrics for that matter, because the way that humans give birth is complicated, sometimes painful, kind of risky, and we give birth to young that require a lot of attention, as some of you may know. Um, and so I'm interested in how that evolved. And um, look, studying the evolution of the pelvis is one way to understand how we came to give birth in this complicated way to large, helpless babies. Um, so we, we used to have this idea of a sort of what we called the obstetrical dilemma, that the evolution of the pelvis was constrained by bipedalism on the one hand and obstetrics on the other. And I think Steve has pointed out some of the reasons why that simple kind of um, model won't work. Um, and I talked earlier today about some of the other factors that I think we need to consider in understanding the evolution of human childbirth besides large brains. Um, one of them is broad shoulders. Humans and human ancestors and other apes have broad, fairly rigid shoulders, which have to pass through the birth canal as well as the head. And obstructed shoulders, or what obstetricians call shoulder dystocia, is frequently a problem that um, women encounter during childbirth that can lead to injury, um, usually of the baby, but of the mother as well. Um, so I think we need to look at shoulder breadth. Um, another thing is large infant size at birth. Um, humans give birth to babies that are quite large compared to, um, relative to the size of the mother compared to, say, chimps and gorillas. Um, and finally, we talked a little bit about some new data on the way that other primates um, give birth, that it turns out that some of the assumptions that we made about how simple birth is in other primates may not really hold up now that we have some more um, observations of childbirth. And the um, story that we usually told about Lucy, which was that um, Lucy and other Australopithecines gave birth in a way in what, a way where they, the baby didn't rotate as it passed through the birth canal, um, that, that we need to maybe question some of those and look at them again. Great, thank you. Um, I thought actually, why don't we have you do a little demonstration okay. with this pelvis here and, and tell us maybe a little bit more about some of the differences between humans, apes, and monkeys in, uh, in birth okay. and why, how it differs. Can you still be able to hear me? Yes, I think so. Okay, um, so um, in humans, the birth canal, which is, this is the inlet of the birth canal, here's the outlet down here. The birth canal is a tunnel of changing cross-sectional shape in humans. So in other primates, it's the birth canal is long from front to back and relatively narrow from side to side. And it stays that way as you pass from the inlet to the midplane to the outlet. Those are planes that obstetricians talk about when they describe the way that the baby passes through. In humans, the birth canal is wide at the top, longer in the middle, and a kind of more rounded at the bottom. And because the baby's head is such a tight fit within the birth canal and the baby's shoulders as well, the baby's head rotates and kind of turns and twists as it passes through in order to, to find the, the dimension that it can actually pass through. So the typical, uh, I'm going to show you, I'm going to demonstrate here, the typical way that the baby's head passes through the birth canal. Um, this isn't the only way that babies are born, right? There's, of course, there's variation in the way that, that babies are born. But this is the way that's, that is most common, and very importantly for an evolutionary understanding, it's the way, the way that's associated with the fewest risks to the mother and the baby. Because infant and maternal mortality at the time of birth are reflections of the selection that the mother's pelvis and the whole birth process is under. So um, typically, the baby's head enters facing to the side, right, everybody? Here's the baby's head. Um, typically, does, it does enters. Does it actually sound like that? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think for now I'm okay, but uh, let's see. So, babies, human babies, obviously are born head first, um, typically, and the baby's head enters facing to the side. So, the longest axis of the baby's head is from the is this long axis from the front to the back, and then as it goes through, it gets obstructed. It can't pass through that way. Okay, and so typically what happens is that the baby rotates, we're gonna see if this really works here, this way. Okay, now you can hold it now. Okay, typically rotates this way, and then passes out with the back of the baby's head, this bone is the occiput, 
to the front of the mother's body. So this is the position that obstetricians call occiput anterior. So the baby is born facing away from the mother, right? This is the mother's belly. The mother's facing you. And the baby is born facing the opposite direction. Um, and then it comes out like this. Um, and us usually, once the head is born, the rest goes fairly quickly. But as I said earlier, sometimes the shoulders um, become obstructed, and that can be a significant um, challenge as well. So because the baby emerges in that position, um, it's very difficult for the mother to reach down and clear the baby's breathing passage or um, remove the umbilical cord from around the neck or support the baby as it emerges. And so humans benefit from having someone else there to assist them during childbirth. Um, and, and in all societies around the world, it's the norm for women to give birth in a social context with other people there, typically mothers, sisters, friends, um, close female relatives, or midwives or obstetricians, um, but somebody who's familiar with the birth process who can help assist the, the mother and baby during the time. And as Steve said earlier, this is a kind of an aspect of what Sarah Hurdy talks about when she talks about humans as cooperative breeders, um, that we, we um, the, the fact that we give birth in this social context. Right, great. Um, Steve, I was wondering if you... I'll look at it. We have, uh, right, we have some questions that were posted on the... Uh, on the website, and one of them was about just the kinds of locomotion that would have, how locomotion would have differed between um, these different species. And, and one question we're looking at osteopithecines, if they were, by one argument, a more efficient biped, what would, what would have been better about how they walked compared to how we walked? And also with the sediba, like what are your speculations about how um, what the pressures might have been for in their locomotion? Those are, are very, very good questions. Um, and again, it depends in part on the, the kind of model that you buy into about locomotion and the Australopiths in general. So if you're in the camp that says that they were good terrestrial bipeds, uh, one of the things that um, uh, researchers who, who sort of think that tend to key in on is the fact that the hip blades extend uh, far laterally beyond the the, um, the hip joint. And the problem for a biped is that we have to support body weight on one leg because we've got to swing the other leg to reposition it. So we have a single leg support phase. And what happens is, you know, if I'm supporting the, the uh, pelvis on the right, I'm standing on my right leg here, body weight is operating um, sort of uh, on average, just a little bit lateral of the center of the sacrum towards the other side, and that's creating a rotational moment or a turning moment which wants to tip the pelvis this way, okay? So we have to prevent our pelvis from dropping down each time we lift our swing leg. Uh, otherwise, it takes a lot of energy and, you know, we're, we're shifting the center of mass a lot. So the way that we do that is we use the small butt muscles, the small gluteal muscles, gluteus medius and gluteus minimus, which are out here on the iliac blade, and they attach to the, the um, uh, edge of the femur, the greater trochanter of the femur, and they basically contract and they pull this end of the, the pelvis back down to counter out, counteract that turning moment in the opposite direction. So um, if you look at Lucy, she's got these, these flaring iliac blades and she's got a long femoral neck, and that kind of gives her great leverage for doing that. Uh, and that's lost a little bit in us. So uh, we actually have to contract these gluteal muscles much more forcefully, uh, which then puts more pressure on the femoral head. We have to have a larger femoral head. So uh, some people like Owen Lovejoy would say, this pelvis is worse for bipedal locomotion than this pelvis, okay? Uh, other people would say, well, you know, but if you look at the total morphological pattern here, um, there are sort of a lot of traits which suggest that uh, Lucy wasn't as good of a biped and that she had to walk on a bent hip, bent knee, and that's energetically very costly. It's a great way of locomoting. You can, you can walk faster that way, and it's actually less hard on your body because the forces that are transmitted up the kinematic chain are reduced by muscles attenuating that, but it's energetically very costly. So... Again, differences in locomotion are going to be a function of who you're talking to. Yeah, can, I, can I throw a question in here? Mm -hmm. uh, Steve, your, your talk 
uh, at the at the webcast and, and things you've said before and written before convinced me personally, and I think convinced a lot of people that one, Sadiba has a more on the whole an overall more human like pelvis than other species of Australopithecus. Okay, and two, that it's probably not going to be related to the demands of increased brain size because the thing doesn't have a big brain. But there are other features in which we're getting a signal from the South African Australopithecines in general that suggest that they were more arboreal mm. than the East African ones that have a less human-like pelvis. So if these things are locomotor adaptations, how come they're showing up in animals that in other respects seem to be having a lingering commitment to life in the trees that we aren't seeing in things like Lucy with a less human-like pelvis? Uh, that's a great question, and I wish I had a great answer to give you. <laughs> um, I, I would like to say that the environment was changing two million years ago, and there are some paleoenvironmental indicators which suggest that South Africa at that time is becoming much more open and drier. Uh, and it would be a nice story if I could tell you that um, Australopithecus sediba is maybe adapting to more terrestrial environments and that, yes, it comes from something like Australopithecus africanus, which was considerably more arboreal, but these guys are being forced into more open environments by climate change. And then in terms of the overall locomotion, um, we don't know yet what to make of that. Uh, our foot expert here uh, <laughs> will tell you that that as best we can figure, there must be something different about the kinematics of bipedal locomotion in this species, uh, unlike anything else we've seen in the fossil record. And how the hip ties into that, we don't yet know. And I'm not even sure how we're gonna get there. Yeah, it's really perplexing. I mean, those of you who have seen casts of the foot, which is really a wonderful opportunity for you to have seen casts of this material, the foot's quite strange. Um, and you haven't even seen the knee yet. Um, the knee is quite strange as well, and yet these are all from the same individual. They're not from you know, different individuals in different parts of the site, as is often the case at places like Hadar or places like Kubifora in East Africa. So having them all from the same individual, um, they have to be working in concert. Um, <laughs> it's just one thing, right? Uh, and, and what exactly that is, we, 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 we really don't know. I think we have some ideas. Um, but it is, I think, incredibly important and really interesting to consider that, that the two hypotheses as they've been posed of the locomotor explanation and the obstetric explanation, I think both are problematic with the Sediba pelvis. Because the obstetric, pelvis, uh, obstetric model is problematic because of, of the size of the, the child's skull, which is, I mean, he's, his brain is not going to get much bigger. Um, but also, if this is something that's living in a wooden environment, has long arms, and is maybe doing some, some climbing, and perhaps, as Matt was saying, is descended from a population that's, that's boreally li living, then the changes that we see in this pelvis may not be reflecting um, adaptations towards a more bipedal locomotion either. Um, it may be a little bit of both. It may be a little bit of neither, I suppose. And that's why I think it's really interesting to consider some of the other explanations for what is going on with the pelvis. That it's not just locomotion and obstetrics, there's, there's diet, uh, as, as some of you guys have written. Um, and then we talked earlier about um, carrying of infants on the hip, and that there is evidence that there is um, reduced energetic cost for women with wider hips carrying their, their babies on their hips. Um, that's not to say that these things had slings and, 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 and strollers, um, but something interesting is going on with this pelvis. Can I just, can I just say one thing about that? I, the, the distinction that I want to make is that to say that something isn't because of obstetrics isn't the same as to say it, that it's because of encephalization, mm -hmm. that there are other obstetric constraints like shoulder width and overall body size that are not... Mm -hmm having a large brain. And I think people traditionally have thought about obstetric constraints as brain size. Yeah, I, I have to confess I was guilty of that until last night when I read your statement, Karen. Um, <laughs> and and um, uh, I, I think really you've caused me to think a lot more about the role of the shoulder. And what's interesting about, about Australopithecus sediba is that the upper limb overall looks very primitive. Uh, it, it's a long 
limb, the scapula is very ape-like. Um, the hand is a bit more derived and, and looks like it's better for manipulation. But overall, the limb is, is very long. And that's some pretty big apparatus, probably, to get through the birth canal. Um, so I think I need to give a little bit more thought to that. But it does raise the question, uh, if um, giving birth to these uh, semi-arboreal animals, which have got relatively primitive upper limbs, creates some obstetric challenges, how come we're not seeing that played out in STS-14, which represents right. Australopithecus africanus, or in Lucy? Yeah. Why suddenly now? Right. No, we need right. to account for it. We need something that differs yeah. between the time of Australopithecus afarensis and the Sedipa material. And I, I don't know what that is either. Jeremy raised the issue about diet, and I thought we could talk about that a little bit more, too. We, we discussed a little bit this in the webinar, but um, people have raised the issue about Australopithecines had, we think, a much bigger gut than Homo, and are there any, is there any sign of that and changes in the pelvis or how the pelvis is structured in order to allow for that larger gut? Um, what do you think, Steve? Is that something that you might see? Yeah, so um, as we talked about in the, the, the webinar, um, I think that you have to take the gut into consideration because the gut has got, it's going to provide some inertial moments. Um, as we walk bipedally, our trunk twists. Each <coughs> time that you advance the swing leg, uh, you're basically twisting your pelvis in that direction, and your entire trunk sort of begins to twist in that direction. And the way that we compensate for that is to swing the contralateral arm, the arm on the opposite side, in pace with the swing leg. And that sort of twists the top of the trunk back in the opposite direction and controls that trunk rotation a little bit. Um, but if you've got a, a, a sizable gut, uh, then you've got to expend more energy because each time you step forward, that gut develops some inertia moving in the opposite direction, mm. and you've got to stop it and move it back to the center. <laughs> so I'm sure guys with big beer bellies <laughs> expend a little bit more energy uh, walking. Have, have, have you considered the possibility that buttocks are counterweight? Buttocks as counterweight. <laughs> I, I see a title of an article here. <laughs> I mean, they're fat, they're fat blobs on the other side of the rotating pelvis. Well, they're fat in, in some of us, Matt, but... Um, <laughs> they're fat in everybody. They're big in some of us. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I hadn't thought about that, actually. But um, it, it may well be that some of this lateral flaring is about the, um, the abdominal obliques, which come off of the iliac blade and, and would be used in countering trunk rotation. So I think that's another thing that we need to think about, and buttocks, too. <laughs> <laughs> well, on that note, I think maybe it's a good time to open the questions up to the, uh, the audience. Um, we are videotaping, and we have two microphones. And when you have a question, please raise your hand. We'll bring you the microphone. Now, these micro microphones do not amplify. They are only for recording into the into the videotape. So you need to talk into the microphone to be recorded, but if it doesn't seem like it's loud, it's because it's not supposed to be loud. It's not, so you need to uh, talk loudly and talk into the microphone. Does anybody have a question? Hi there. Um, the graphic in Dr. Rosenberg's presentation that showed various hominin pelvis um, and the size of the uh, the head at birth um, is, is well known, but the um, reference to the shoulders as an additional obstetric concern or constraint, I'm wondering, are there any data on, on fossil infant shoulder breath or extrapolations based on children's fossil shoulder breath? Um, it's a good question, and um, there's a couple of issues. One is that having a broad, broad shoulders is a primitive condition, right? This is something that we share with apes. So I don't know that um, I think it necessarily has changed that much um, during the course of human evolution, though it's possible. Um, but we, we don't really have good data from fossil infants on this. Part of the problem is that the, the shoulders and clavicle are, are fragmentary and not often found. But another problem is that one of the things that's changing in human evolution is the point at which babies are born relative to their development. So it's a little bit hard for us to know for sure, say, if we 
did have a fossil of a supposed newborn to know exactly where it is relative to to when it would have been born, to know how old it is relative to when it would have been born. So it's something that I think we don't have a lot of good fossil data from at the moment. Well, that, that brings up the question then about, um, so with chimpanzees, for example, the, the space in the pelvis, the opening is quite large for the head, but what about chimpanzee shoulders? Where do they, it would be great to see a graphic on that. Yeah, and I, I don't have one now, although maybe we could get the data for chimps, but remember that chimps' body sizes are much smaller. Their babies are about half the size of human babies relative to their mothers, right? So if human babies are about 6% the size of their mothers at birth, um, chimpanzees are like two or three. Um, so there's much more room in there um, for chimpanzee babies to pass through. And that's why I think from what we know so far, the shoulders aren't a constraint for them because even though the shoulders are broad, the birth canal is big relative to the size of the baby. But in humans, the shoulders are broad and the birth canal is a tight fit relative to the size of the baby. So in monkeys, where it's a tight fit, they don't have the broad shoulders. So Thank that you. raises a question either for you, Karen, or for Jeremy, since he did uh, a lot of this original work. Why do humans give birth to such large body size babies? What's up with that? Um, we have chunkier kids. There's a lot of body fat in babies compared. So the ratio of body fat uh, to, to the overall size of the individual in, in modern humans is considerably larger. So babies are chunky. Um, uh, and that's compared to chimps. fuel brain development? Yeah, uh, yeah. yeah. brain in reserve um, is how it's been called. Um, but the fact that those sort of ratios of comparisons between infant to, to, um, to mother seem to extend back into Australopithecines, m I think makes it a little more complicated than that because I don't think there's strong evidence that Australopithecines would have necessarily had a massive amount of body fat because that requires a high quality diet that I don't think we're seeing in until the genus homo uh, so what exactly is happening there i'm not entirely sure but what, what was interesting in the calculations i thought was that australopithecines seem to have been giving birth to babies that were slightly larger than a modern chimp or a modern gorilla what really differed was that the females were exceptionally small and it's not just lucy um, we have postcranial evidence from a lot of material in Sturfontein and, and hadar of really small females um, the, the, the idea that Lucy is somehow unusually small um, just doesn't work uh, when you look at the, the, the whole body of evidence from Australopithecines. The females were really, really, really small. And I think that is an incredibly interesting question to address right now of, of why were they so small? Because um, it's not necessarily that, that dimorphism uh, uh, increased in, in Australopithecines. If that was the primitive condition, um, the females are even smaller than, than some of the reconstruct well, some modern chimpanzee females. Um, so why there would be selection against body size in females, I think, is an interesting question, if, in fact, that's what's going on. So you think the difference is mostly between human and eight babies is actually mostly fat and not skeletal? I'm not sure. Length or, or yeah, I'm not sure. I mean, it's, it's in, interesting to know the, that. Yeah, the, I mean, the only way I was able to calculate the size of an infant in, in an extinct species that's never less, left us the fossilized mm -hmm. remains of infants is because uh, humans, chimps, and gorillas have a lot of conserved ratios. Um, that if there's conservation across all these primates, then of course that's probably what's going on in, in an extinct group that's related to, to humans. Um, where there's no conserved ratio at all is the body fat issue. So at what point do we start having more baby body fat um, when humans are distinct from chimps and gorillas? Is it, is it a question that's incredibly difficult, if not possible, to, to address, to answer. Jeremy, is there actually any evidence that the baby, human babies have more body fat, or is it just that they have more subcutaneous fat? I'm not sure. Because I don't know sure. of any quantitative estimate of visceral fat in the, mm -hmm. in the mesentery, intra-abdominal fat in, in any hominoid, adult or, or infant, except uh, humans. No, I don't know. I don't know. You know, they probably, it doesn't look like they have very much body, you know, fat in that area, but it's probably is mostly subcutaneous. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, the whole so body. They, they got nothing under their skin, but they may have a lot tucked away in their the mesenteries of their guts. I, I wanted to ask a question that kind of relates to this issue. Sure. 
of um, uh, brain in reserve, and I, I have to make the awful squealing noises getting the baby. <laughs> this is an unnatural act. Yeah, I apologize. Ever <laughs> there we go. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, the, uh, Karen, the, the Tegan Lovejoy slide that you showed with the pictures of the, you know, first the, the ape and then the Australopithecus afarensis and then the rotating human baby going through the birth canal. Uh, the di all those diagrams showed fontanelles on the skulls of the newborns. Mm -hmm. My impression, and I'd like you to correct me if I'm wrong, is that fontanelles are not something you see in apes. That is correct, yeah. Okay. Uh, for those of you who don't know what fontanelles are, it's the soft spots in between the bones in a, in a newborn baby's head. All over the skull, there are these gaps between the bones that are, that are just filled with fibrous connective tissue, membranes. And the reason they're there, supposedly, uh, in humans and not in, say, chimpanzees, is that the human baby's skull actually changes shape. It squishes and stretches, you know, like a, like a 1930s Mickey Mouse cartoon as it goes, as it goes through the the birth canal. And I was wondering, unfortunately, we don't have any neuro people up here at the, in the podium, but maybe there's some out there in the audience. I was wondering what this implies about human neurological development. Um, can you really squish a brain around like that without uh, having implications for the amount of uh, number of axonal connections yeah. that you can have at a cellular level? And you know, if not, then then maybe the reason that we have this this these peculiarly helpless infants that have to do all of this this brain growth postnatally is that is that they're coming out and having their brains scrambled by the trauma <laughs> yeah. of, so, of, of wriggling around through a birth canal. So this is absolutely right. Um, wait, wait. Why don't you wait for the microphone? Wouldn't that suggest, therefore, that women who voluntarily go through cesarean sections would produce infants that scored better sure. on intention, <laughs> intelligence, yeah. intelligence yeah, yeah. scores versus women who decided to give birth, all else being equal? OK, well, let me answer that, but let me do this part first. So, when, so actually, if you look at, I have some old x-rays from the time when people um, didn't realize how dangerous it was of x-rays of um, women giving birth. And, um, and you can see, actually, the cranial bones overlapping, like to make a few millimeters of, of extra space. And that's called molding. And if you've ever seen a newborn baby that was born after a really difficult vaginal birth, they have those kind of funny cone head shapes that might be a little bit scary to the parents. <laughs> okay, but, they um, are. but they actually represent that deformation as it passes through. So too much of that causes brain damage. I mean, it's a balance. If, you, um, if, you, if babies that have experienced too much molding actually get, have, have problems afterwards um, and have brain damage. But a little bit of it is very common. And, and I think it's right that one of the sources of selection on the timing of birth in humans is that if we're born early in our development, those um, bones haven't fused and we're able to have this sort of collapsing um, of the, the cranial bones. Um, about the um, cesarean sections, let me say a little bit about that. So cesarean section rates in the United States are getting very, very high. Um, in some places, it's 30 percent. And in some other countries, it's even higher. In Brazil and Italy, uh, almost half of births are done by cesarean section. And obviously, there are all sorts of reasons for that. Um, convenience for the doctors, um, economic reasons, liability reasons. Um, but there's actually some evidence that there are good things that happen to babies that are born vaginally, um, that, that actually that whole process can be good for the respiratory system, um, and that, that there are benefits to being born vaginally that are lost by this um, hyper-technological birth of C-section. So. Any other questions? So like quite a few back there. Go ahead. Hey, good afternoon. I just had a one point on the, the head shaping idea and then just another question. And and I I am a bioarchaeologist and I work in the Andes and we see 
intentionally modified crania all the time. And, and I think archaeologists in lots of parts of the world see that. So, of course, this is in uh, modern Homo sapiens from very recent context as compared to what our colleagues that work in, in paleoanthropology see. But I don't think there's anything that suggests um, that folks that were practicing intentional modification of the cranial vault, there, there's any kind of impairment associated with that. Um, and again, it's a practice of, we're not necessarily sure how soon after birth it happens, but we know it happens pretty young. And we, we've found, you know, certainly examples of, of juvenile crania that are in the process of being yeah. shaped in that way. So, um, yeah, let me just say that too much of it though, I mean, it, it can be harmful, but absolutely. And so my, my follow-up question, um, for those of us thinking about, um, you know, the, in the issue of, uh, so I also work in forensic anthropology and uh, again, bioarchaeology, and we're interested, and in, people have historically looked at the pelvis of, uh, of, of Paris women and nulliparous women to see if there is that, that, that gold standard predictive indicator if a woman has gone through birth. And some have said the dorsal pit, and others have said the extension of pubic tubercle. Others have suggested perhaps these large dimensions. So is there anything that this panel would look at today that might offer an insight of, you know, in the unknown case with any predictive power if, if a woman has given birth? Um, I think that there's a very good correlation between <coughs> those things that you mentioned and the preauricular sulcus um, on, the, um, on the ilium, but it's not a perfect case. And we certainly know instances of males with some of those parturition scars, and we have instances of females that we know gave birth who don't have them. So there's, but there's a very good correlation, so. Yeah, on the issue of artificial cranial deformation, uh, that's a f much slower process, and, and it allows for normal growth, both of neural and, and bone tissues. Uh, it's just that the pressure has been changed under the uh, under the conditions of normal growth. I think it's rather different from, you know, spending two hours violently squeezing the skull around and making the bones overlap. Yeah. Um, I think there was a question earlier about the lack of sexual dimorphism in the pelvises of um, of Australopithecus, you know, male and female, and how if it was obstetrics, then wouldn't you expect there to be a lot of sexual dimorphism? Um, but then somebody said um, that there's evidence that it's like an energy benefit for Australopithecines to have a wide pelvis for infant carrying. And so if there's a lack of sexual dimorphism, could that possibly suggest that there was a lot of male infant carrying in Australopithecus? Well, I'm going to let Jeremy tackle that since <laughs> he's the one who brought it up. But yeah. um, Sorry about that. There's a recent paper that he, I know that we yeah. read in the class about that, about uh, infant, uh, male infant carrying. So. Um, Some speculations about that. But I will say that, um, that I think, so it's a question as to when in evolutionary uh, history the kind of sexual dimorphism that we see in living humans today was actually established. And I think, uh, I don't have any good evidence for this, but I, I, I think that that really is about obstetrics and that really is about bigger brains uh, or bigger shoulders, um, but probably bigger brains. Um, but as for the infant carrying stuff, I'll let Jeremy. Well, I, I mean, I'll certainly agree with you on the, the sexual dimorphism issue that um, I think it's incredibly difficult to tell um, for some of these specimens that are unassociated, because many of these pelvis we, we find um, are not associated with craniodental material, so we don't know necessarily even what species they're from, never mind if it's a male or a female. But if you do have a, a group of specimens, and, and I know I've done this with, with one of my classes, that we've looked at the Homo erectus material that's been uh, purported to be from that species, um, it's very difficult to decide what's a male and what's a female. And if you use modern criteria to distinguish males and females, you have females that are six feet tall, um, which maybe that's possible, certainly. Um, but you run into that difficulty of then trying to explain um, some of the postcrania and some of the craniodental material that's actually pointing in, in the other direction that maybe erectus had quite a bit of sexual dimorphism. Um, and so it's, it's quite difficult in the, you know, as Matt is illustrating. 
Um, the recent crany on the left, uh, thought to be from a female Homo erectus, suggesting there is, and on the right, a male erectus, suggesting that there is quite a bit of male-female di dimorphism, um, at least in the, in the skulls. Um, infant carrying with males, I think, is a really interesting question. It's difficult to test um, in Australopithecines. What exactly would you need to look for in their bones to tell that this is going on? It's incredibly difficult. Um, but one of the things that, that I think is important is looking at some of the, um, the anatomical changes that might be related to the necessity of having um, uh, shared parental care, or at least alloparenting, in Australopithecines. So for instance, the idea of giving birth to larger, brained inf uh, larger bodied infants, big kids, who don't necessarily have much of a grasping ability anymore to their moms. Now, it doesn't mean moms turning to, to a, a male or a father in this particular context, but perhaps that's happening. Um, something else to look for, I think, is uh, the weaning age of these things. Once these individuals are, are being weaned, um, uh, if it's happening at an earlier age, they're going to be relying on other individuals in their community. And I think there's dental evidence that weaning in Australopithecines was quite ape-like early on, at three, three and a half million years ago or so, but by the time of Tong Child, who is two and a half million years old or so, uh, all the molars have been worn, the deciduous molars have worn down, suggesting that it is not just drinking milk anymore, that it may have been weaned already. So if a four-year-old is being weaned, there need to be other caretakers. That thing is not gonna survive on its own with a bunch of leopards and hyenas running around. Um, and, and again, whether it's the father, whether it's a male involved or not, is, uh, who knows? That's a very, very difficult question to, to answer, I think. Actually, but a good one to ask. Jeremy, do you think that change, possible change in weaning age indicates a change in birth spacing? I would think it does. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah I, th I think it would. And, and keep in mind that I'm basing it on two specimens. Um, <laughs> there's a three and a half year old individual, I'm sorry, there's a three and a half million year old afarensis individual. <laughs> Uh, who's, who's about four years old when she died, and then there's the Tong child, which happened a million years later. Uh, and there are other juvenile specimens that have been found, but, and as we find more, we can begin to see the kind of variation that I think is going to be necessary to address the question. Uh, but the two specimens that have been found up to this point are really, really interesting and in suggesting something cool is going on in that time period in Australopithecines. This is not my idea. That's something Leslie Aiello has published in, in 1991. Why would the, in terms of the weaning age, though, I mean, you have, they're incorporating solid food probably at six months, like most apes. So why would they be more? They don't wear down their teeth very much. So the apes, uh, uh, e even though they are incorporating solid food, still mm. have pretty high cusps until they're, until they're weaned, until they're not drinking milk. That's my understanding of the data. Hmm. Okay. I just wanted to say a couple of things. One is that, you know, people think about um, the shift from some ape-like condition to Australopithecus as being something that was just a locomotor change. And of course that's probably true, but the locomotor change certainly had obstetrical consequences, even if it wasn't an adaptation that happened because of childbirth, but it had to affect childbirth, even if, even if the Tegan Lovejoy reconstruction isn't, isn't correct, and we, we can argue about that, there were some we know that Australopithecines were not giving birth the way that living apes do. So I think that's another way in which those two different constraints interact. And then the other thing I just wanted to say is that it's not just fathers and mothers who carry babies and who would benefit from the effects of you know, being able to carry on wide hips. And cross-culturally, children carry babies all the time. So um, that, and that can be part of sort of the alloparenting um, cooperative breeding model that we've been talking about before. We have some other questions that were over here. Um, and also, okay, how about over here? One. Hi, uh, yes. With, um, particularly like with early Australopithecines, if there was sort of this bipedalism on the bent hip, bent knee, would we see that in sort of like the shape of the axis of the um, SI joint or the acetabular region? I don't know. I don't know. Jeremy? <laughs> well, I don't think they were moving with a bent hip, bent knee. Um, and that's from evidence from the, from the ankle joint and the knee. That um, I think they did have an extended leg um, and an extended hip during, during bipedal locomotion. Um, to what degree it would affect the, the acetabulum, um, 
I'm not sure. Yeah, that's that's a really good question. I mean, I would suspect it would, because on a on a on an angled surface, all things being equal, you're going to be loading a, a, a completely different part of the acetabulum. So you might, you might expect the lunate su surface to be enlarged more anteriorly than if it's if it's more vertical, then you might accept, expect a more um, evenly distributed lunate surface. And I'm the, not sure. If, well, if the, claim, the claim by Stern and Sussman back in 1982 was that that was the case, in fact, mm -hmm. was, that, was that you could see by looking at the shape of the, the weight-bearing surface inside the hip socket that uh, Lucy was not exerting thrust through a fully extended hip, and that meant she was walking along in a shamble with her knees and her hips bent. But there's, there's, as Jeremy says, there are reasons for not believing that, having to do with such things as the, the way in which the knee joints develop. They don't have the interlocking surfaces between the end bit and the shaft bit that, that animals that walk around with their knees bent all the time seem to have to keep the two bits from coming apart. There's also a little pit that forms in the distal femur and a fully extended knee that the patella rides up and you can find this little pit in the distal femur. And um, I've never been able to find that in the casts of the afarensis material, um, but the originals have it. You can mm. see it in the originals. So seeing it, it's, looking at the originals is really important to see that. Um, I think they did have a fully extended knee. Mm -hmm. That kind of relates to another question someone had about running, and there's been lots of recent uh, work about perhaps the importance of running in human evolution and how that might have affected the the pelvis and the way that um, these sort of barefoot runners like the Tarahumara run with uh, straight spine and relaxed knees, apparently. Do you think that's true or how that, how could running affected the pelvis? Yeah, it seems, I mean, the argument, as far as I understand it, is that the big problem with a running Lucy is her, her flaring ilia. Um, just for the reasons that Steve was saying about creating this this moment of you know if you're walking and it's an issue of balancing that that torque, imagine now you're running, and there's a massive amount of momentum then carrying you. Um, so the, the flaring ilia may may present a problem for that, and so some have reconstructed Lucy as a walker but not a runner. Um, Steve, you want to? So would Sadiba be able to run? Oh, well, yeah, I think they could run, than but I, I don't think that means they were doing it a lot. Yeah. Um, and, you know, no disrespect to Dan Lieberman, but um, I'm not sure I buy this whole running argument <coughs> anyway. And, and really the problem that I have with it is um, the, this idea that cursorial hunting was sort of a, a major selective mm -hmm. force on the development of the human locomotor skeleton. The problem is it's very hard to see intermediate steps that selection could favor um, you, what do you gain by slightly tuckering out an antelope by chasing it for two minutes that buys you an advantage, uh, you know, that selects for, for morphology that then allows your descendants to run three minutes or ten minutes? It seems like you have to have the whole package in place before selection can, can favor it. <coughs> uh, and to me, that seems like an insurmountable obstacle to the, the, the entire hypothesis. Mm -hmm. And it's not the most energetically effective way to, to capture prey anyway. <coughs> uh, so in a way, I'm not sure I buy the, the, the premise to begin with. OK, so other questions are over here. Um, how about up in the front here? OK, it was said earlier that the changes to Sedibus's hip may be from diet. Is there any evidence from the site that they were under a changing diet or any other evidence in the skeleton, other structures that changed that may indicate a shift in diet? Yeah, so um, one thing that's interesting about Sediba is the teeth are smaller and the um, chewing muscles are smaller. So for instance, if you look at the temporal lines, which is where the temporalis muscle, the chewing muscle on the side of the cranium, um, in Sediba it's down about here. In Australopithecus africanus, which has the same size brain or actually even a little bit bigger, uh, they meet on the midline and they almost form a sagittal crest. And we used to think that was just because their brains were so small, you know, that, you know, you have a large muscle attached to a small brain case, they're going to meet at the midline and maybe even need the development of a little sagittal crest to anchor them. And then we found this guy, and this has the very homo configuration of these more laterally positioned temporal lines, and it has a tiny little brain. Um, so that tells us the temporal muscles are a lot smaller. Mm. 
But it's a juvenile. It is a juvenile. Um, uh, so it is hard to know sort of how much more development is going to occur there, but I suspect not a lot. I don't imagine that those temporal lines are going to migrate up. And the teeth are smaller. Mm -hmm. the, the mandible and maxilla that anchor the teeth are smaller. So this suggests either higher quality diet or they're doing some kind of food processing so that they're breaking down fiber um, in the diet or something like that. And that might relate then to a smaller gut and changes downstream. Do we have juvenile robustus or boisei specimens that show where the temporal lines are? I can't, I can't think, think of, any. of a single one. No. Somebody needs to go out and find one. <laughs> <laughs> See, uh, Rachel? Um, my question also has to do with diet. Um, I have a bit of a problem with the theory that the iliac blades widen due to a large gut size, just because we see apes like orangutans and other primates like proboscis monkeys who do have a really large gut size. And I was wondering what your thoughts are, like what, what other pressures would lead to the widening of the iliac blades if it does have to do with diet? Yeah, so uh, there are lots of primates that have big guts. Chimps have got have got very long guts and they've got this little pouchy gut thing, but they're quadrupedal. So it may well be, now, you know, mind you, I'm not really saying that the guts are, are the explanation. I'm saying that it doesn't appear to be something about obstetrics. Maybe it's about shoulders, but it doesn't really look like it's about obstetrics. So therefore it must be something else. It must be locomotion or guts and locomotion or something like that. Um, but if it's guts, it must be because things change when you're a biped, and those rotary moments become important when you're a biped in a way that doesn't bother a quadruped. Sam right here. Thank you. Um, staying on the same lateral flare of the ilia, I was wondering how much of that could be due to reconstruction or damage during fossilization? Yeah. So uh, that's a really good, mm -hmm. good question. And in fact, if you look at what we have of the adult female from Sediba, you'll see that the um, uh, anterior portion of the iliac blade is actually missing. So we feel pretty confident about this reconstruction because we had point of contact down here with, between the sacrum and the auricular surface. We have fairly good contact all the way along the superior pubic ramus. Um, but we did have to reconstruct this anterior uh, iliac blade, and what we relied on were the curvatures which were evident in the preserved portion and also sort of where you can see the curvature going in the broken edge here. Um, but it, it, you know, people have pointed out that it's quite possible that this had a more Lucy-like um, iliac blade extending out laterally. We think we're right, but the great thing about this site is, it, is we think that we're going to get more of these two individuals, and we will probably find her iliac blade on the other side, and hopefully it will have those portions. And if we're wrong, we'll know it. And if we're right, that will show it. So. Could you use, because um, at the hip joint, you don't just have the pelvis side of things. You've got the femoral side of things, too. How correlated is the flaring of the iliac blades with the length of the femoral neck. Yeah. So could you could you use something about what you see in chimps and humans and you know Narakotomi and all the other yeah. you know, the other two associated skeletons we have. So that's a that's a great question. So the Australopiths tend to have a long femoral neck and it's been argued that it's part of this um, uh, abductor mechanism that you know you've got to position the muscles out here and also to increase the leverage you've got to to position the attachment of those muscles pretty far from the hip joint. Um, the interesting thing about Sediba is that its neck appears to be long. Uh, I know you and I have sort of have come to different conclusions about that because we're measuring it in different yeah, ways, yeah, and I think yeah. we need to get, sort of get together and, and really work this <laughs> out. But um, from my measurements, it looks like the, the neck is about as long relative to body size as in other australopiths, yet the iliac blade is is higher. Mm -hmm. um, and Lovejoy actually suggested that um, the femoral neck shortens in the genus Homo 
because as body size increases, you run the risk of breaking it. It's a cantilevered beam. Mm -hmm. It gets bent by body weight. And as we got larger and larger, you run a higher and higher risk of breaking the femoral neck during locomotion or if you have to run from a lion or, or whatever. Uh, and so it may well be that there wasn't pressure to reduce the length of the femoral neck until body size increased. Mm -hmm. Steve, in principle, raising the height of the iliac blade, depending on the angle at which the muscle is pulling, might have the same effect as increasing its breadth. That is, it might shift the, the line of pull of the muscle further away from the pivot point and give the muscle more leverage. Mm -hmm. Have you compared, have you tried to do comparative measurements of sort of estimates of the, of the, uh, the resultant, you know, the summed muscle pull for the, the deep glutei on Sidipa versus some of the other australopiths? We have not done that yet, but we plan to do those kinds of detailed biomechanical analyses. I think it's also uh, fair to mention that most of the pelvises that have been found also have some kind of reconstruction done on them, right? So that that's complicates the interpretation because it depends yeah. on how they're reconstructed. I mean, even beautiful Lucy, um, who is as preserved as can be, you would think, um, you know, that right in front of you, there's a piece of her that's been distorted, and there is great debate as to how distorted is it. You reconstruct it one way, and you get a pelvis that looks like this. You reconstruct it a different way and you get a pelvis with iliac blades that are more in the sagittal plane and would be a better biped according to the Lovejoy model. So it's, it's very difficult, even with a beautifully preserved pelvis, to, to have a good reconstruction. There's a question, um, Karen, that came up about, you mentioned about the occipital posterior birth in chimpanzees now have been shown to have that. How does that affect our interpretation of like when that evolves, that ancestral condition then, or is that convergent. So chimpan we always thought the old story was that chimpanzees gave birth facing the same direction as their mother. So that would be occiput posterior. Um, and the, this evidence from this Japanese study um, that observed three chimpanzees in a laboratory showed that they gave birth occiput anterior the way that humans do. So I think, I think we have to, to re-examine our assumptions about that. Um, I certainly, I wouldn't have predicted that um, at all. Um, and I, I mean, I'd like to know if that's common to chimps in general. I'd like to have some, you know, wild studies, wild observations, which I, I know it's very difficult for us to get. Um, I'd like to know about the other apes, but we don't really know that yet. But certainly we have to question our assumptions, I think. Right, and it's so hard to get that data because they're giving birth in the wild in, in nests by themselves, and there's not a video camera right. <laughs> inside there that you can see. Even if you do observe them giving birth, you're not that close to be able to But if, even if that. it's even if it turns out that occiput anterior presentations are common in chimpanzees, it's still the case that the sort of configuration of human birth is different and presumably that humans still benefit from assistance in a way that chimpanzees don't. Right. Because right. they give birth fine by themselves. Right. right. Do we know how chimps start off in the birth canal? Like we assume that they start all start the same way. You know what I mean? So if they're Exiting, you know, does it necessarily have to involve a rotation? Right. Could they have started? We don't know, but but remember that the birth canal is elongated AP mm -hmm. at all planes. So there's certainly not, it's certainly difficult to imagine. I guess it's not impossible, but um, the head being born in a transverse orientation, yeah, yeah. for instance. Right. Although there's so much room to spare, it's possible. Right, it may just come out. Maybe they can't. We don't know. There's no we don't know. constraints on it. Well, can't help but think that the shoulders are, are driving some of yeah. this postural stuff. Hmm. Okay, who has other questions? Yes, back here. Um, so Professor Rosenberg maybe made the important point that it's not just uh, body size, um, not, so, not just brain size driving the evolution of the pelvis, but body size too. So when we look at Sediba, um, all the evidence says that it has a similar sized brains to other australopithecines. But, and I guess this kind of seems intuitively kind of far-fetched, but is there any reason to, to believe, is it plausible that there could have been a differential rate of body growth in the womb? As, so they'd be giving birth to bigger, ba bigger body bra babies instead of like bigger brain babies? So like the obstetric model be supported by body size instead of brain size? Right. It's it's possible. I, I can't think of a way to test it, but I have to say Jerry has thought of ways to test some of these questions that I wouldn't have thought of. So what do you think, Jerry? <laughs> um, it's possible. 
Sure. I mean, all I've done is sort of applied what, what we see in humans and what we see in chimps and what we see in gorillas and assume that the same thing is going on in australopithecines. And um, it all starts with the brain. And from an adult brain, you can calculate the size of the infant brain. And from an infant brain, you can calculate the size of the body because the ratios all remain the same across the apes for the most part. Um, when I apply that, I, I tried it with Australopithecus one, you know, the second it was found. I mean, sorry, but once I saw that publication, I plugged in my data and, and uh, it, it fits like an Australopithecus, um, as you would expect, given, given the size of the brain. And, and you know, it's on the low end because the brain is on the low end. That's the driver. I think, uh, but might it be possible that this is doing something different? Yeah, sure. But um, I will point out that the um, the pelvic inlet—that's all we have in this female. We can't actually uh, reconstruct the midplane or the the pelvic outlet uh, because we don't have the ischium. But the pelvic inlet is isn't really any bigger than Lucy's or STS 14. So we don't see any evidence that there's an increase here, which would suggest that there's a larger bodied baby or a larger brained baby or anything. Okay, other questions? I'll ask another one. Mm -hmm. um, as far as the uh, Lytoli uh, footprints go, uh, with the bent, bent knee, bent hip, bent hip uh, didn't the kinematic data from that um, show that, well, assuming it's uh, afferensis, um, that they were walking more like humans do, not bent, bent hip, bent knee? Well, so there was a study by Dave Raiklin and others where they had people walking through wet sand, uh, doing sort of normal striding bipedalism like we do, and then walking, Groucho walking, <coughs> bent hip, bent knee. And what they found is that um, in the, the bent hip, bent knee condition, people sort of slam the heel down, and then there's a break and then you get the, uh, the sort of forefoot planting down fairly forcefully, and it leaves a very, very different kind of footprint than somebody walking with a full um, striding bipedal gait. Um, <coughs> and then their conclusion was that the Laetoli footprints are not like the bent hip, bent knee. They're, they're like the full striding biped. I look at those Laetoli prints, and I look at the contour lines, and I can't really see what they're seeing there. So I'm not entirely convinced that those are our footprints um, that are more like a striding biped. Um, but it may well be that they, they reflect striding bipedalism, as, as Jeremy said. I don't know. Can we give you an example of the study with the children? Yeah, so you know there was a, a, a nice paper that was published by um, a colleague of ours, Peter Schmid, where he had um, children. He used children because they're about the same stature as, um, as Lucy uh, or uh, the smaller bodied Australopiths. And uh, he had them walk barefoot across wet sand. And what he found was that when they, they just walk normally across wet sand, they leave a footprint like we would leave, uh, where the heel comes down, weight is transferred to the lateral side of the foot, and then it rolls back across the ball of the foot and then you toe off with the big toe, primarily with the big toe. So you get the deepest impressions, you know, from heel to the outside, then back across the ball, and then to the big toe. But he then had them walk across the wet sand carrying a, a, a ball, not a super heavy ball, but heavy enough that the kids couldn't manage their trunk rotation anymore. And they started sort of excessively rotating their trunks. And then they produced footprints like Laetoli where you see more of the force being exerted out on the lateral side of the foot and the lateral toes. Uh, and that suggested to him that there was some kind of trunk rotation thing going on, maybe having to do with the positioning of the, the uh, abdominal oblique muscles or larger gut size or something like that. Yeah, the, other, the other thing to bear in mind here is that there is at least a lingering minority of people who are reasonably uh, convinced that that there's two species in what's now considered the uh, hypodyme of Australopithecus afarensis, that the small ones are a different species from the big ones, and if so, they might have very different locomotor adaptations. There's a question also about the uh, of the pelvis saying what what makes our modern pelvis or is, what features might make it more difficult to climb. So you talk about sort of constraints about arboreality versus stress reality, and what, a, what about the changes in the, the modern pelvis may climbing more difficult in Yeah, in so a couple humans. of things right off the back bat. One is that um, 
uh, and I'm sure Jeremy can speak to this um, uh, very well as well, but um, chimpanzees have a very, very stiff back. Uh, you know, they have these very high iliac blades. Um, the lower lumbar vertebra are between the iliac blades, so there's not any opportunity for rotation back here. And then they have very, very powerful apaxial muscles or, or back muscles, um, which kind of prevent uh, flexion of the back during climbing and allow the chimp to use the back for leverage. And then they have this very, very long ischium, which creates a great um, moment arm, great leverage for the hamstring muscles. So that as a chimp is going up a tree, it's got, you know, it's flexed its, its hips, flexed its femora, and it can use those powerful hamstring muscles to propel it up, up the tree. So, you know, we sort of lost some of these things when we shortened the, the pelvis. Mm -hmm. And um, we have a much more, yeah, we have a much more mobile back, uh, much less mechanical advantage for the hamstring muscles. What else would you say? That works for me. Um, yeah, I think those two are great. I think the problem, though, is that um, the model that we have for climbing is the chimpanzee model. And I don't think, if Australopithecines were climbing, I don't think they were climbing anything like a modern chimp was, is climbing. Um, the fact that they had five and maybe six lumbar vertebrae, there, you know, there are many suggestions that they had six, which um, Lovejoy is, is called the antithesis of climbing, uh, having more lumbars would be even more problematic. But, but if this kind of reconstruction is right, and the ilia are actually supporting the abaxial muscles back here and stiffening the lower back, then maybe that's a, that's a compensation. But um, certainly in the foot and the ankle and the knee, all of the adaptations that you need to climb like a chimp climbs, you don't see in an australopithecine at all. Um, so it means that if they're climbing, if there are adaptations for climbing in the upper limb, they're doing it their own way. They're doing it in a biomechanically different kind of way, perhaps in different kinds of trees, uh, or perhaps the human climber is the better model for understanding climbing in these things, because yeah, there are humans that climb today. And maybe we sh and there's almost no work at all uh, on the biomechanics of human climbing. Uh, we have no idea of what the skeletal impacts would be on human climbers, and I think that might be an actual, actually a better model for understanding some of the anatomies in these things, but. Right, makes sense in the chimps. Did you have a question, Sarah? Are there questions over here? Yes, okay. I had a question um, based on, that would gauge maybe more the emergence of bipedality as prevalent. Um, I know stress fractures are pretty common. Modern humans, I've had one in the foot. I know people who've had hip stress fractures. Could maybe a study of injuries of stress fractures and those could that maybe tell when, give like a line when bipedality was main and climbing was out, or would that just give you an idea of people were getting hurt rather than a cutoff time? Yeah, well, we'd have to have some fossils that had stress, stress fractures, and I don't believe we do. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> there are broken, there are breaks we, we find in the fossil record, healed breaks occasionally. Um, there's a cubifora femur that has a healed break and a tibia that, that had a broken ankle at some point healed. But, I mean, unfortunately, if, if I, I, th I think if, if you're living in East Africa two million years ago and you get a stress fracture, you're going to get eaten. Sorry. <laughs> um, and the you're not going to make act, it into the fossil record. Yeah. The, well, yeah. The, the, the selection would act quite fiercely against those kinds of anatomies that would cause that. Also, I think a lot of the reasons why we have those fractures today are because of the modern lifestyle that wouldn't apply um, in the past, so they would be much less likely to. Almost any kind of loading of bone is going to produce micro cracks. Is there any possibility that those could be detected in fossil bone and that there would be different patterns that would correspond to different loading regimes? Yes. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> well, been, I mean, there's been plenty of work looking at trabecular bone structure. Yeah, that's whether, different. Whether, yeah, yeah, and but but it's been it's been uh, boy, it's been a mixed bag. And when yeah. we look at the micro anatomy of of you know there was this uh, you know, 10, 15 years ago, there was this moment of this is now going to be the future of paleoanthropology of looking at trabecular bone orientation. It's going to tell us exactly what the loading environment is going to be on these joints, and we're going to answer all of these questions of exactly how these things are moving. And um, there's been um, 
just a, a 15 years of I exceedingly, um, uh, well, complex papers and, and, and difficult to interpret results. Yeah. yeah. Remind me to tell you about split lines after this is all over. Sure. <laughs> okay. The other question someone had was about relaxation of constraints. So if you have the, is it possible that you have a change in the pelvis first, like the sediba pelvis is, is opened up, does that allow then the evolution of bigger brains in the sense that kind of like relaxation of the of uh, energy going to the gut sort of is a constraint which kept sort of brains from getting bigger. Now they're allowed to get bigger. So once you have a bigger opening, if that was at all constraining brain growth, that, that it sort of opens the, the window for increased brain that, size. That's a really interesting idea. You know, and I, in general, I like constraint models like that because I, I think they often have great explanatory power, like the expensive tissue hypothesis. But um, then we have to ask, okay, where is the constraint coming from? And probably, you know, the only, the only thing I could think of is maybe there just wasn't the variation there that selection could operate on, but then why do we suddenly see it later? Um, you know, so it's hard to imagine what would cause the birth canal to actually get larger if there's not something driving that. You see what I mean? That makes sense? Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. Any questions? Is that several over here? Okay, how about um, back there? Or, sorry. Okay. Um, I'm curious about if you found any sort of evidence uh, where diets that benefited bone development were naturally selected and how that might have changed. Like instead of diet and gut, but like diet and calcium hmm. deposits or whatever. How, what, what, are, what are those findings? Karen? <laughs> Steve? <laughs> <laughs> Um, I don't know. I really I don't know much about the the um, nutritional chemistry of calcium. Certainly, when you're incorporating more animal tissue, and maybe if you're ingesting a little bit of bone, you know, you're crunching up smaller smaller stuff. Um, you're certainly going to get good good calcium that way. But I I think that uh, plant based diets are actually pretty rich in calcium too. So I'm not aware of any work that's been done looking at the relationship between diet and bone chemistry and the effects that they may have on bone architecture and biomechanics. Mm. Yeah, there's, a, there's a relationship between str strontium calcium ratios. Strontium is, a, as you all know, a, an element that is chemically in a lot of ways like calcium. I think it's the next notch down on the periodic table or something. And, but it, it doesn't work as well in bone. It doesn't make the, the kinds of solid bonds with carbonates or whatever that are necessary to make bone strong. And it, it gets filtered out by vertebrates uh, uh, preferentially. If you feed vertebrates a mixture of strontium and calcium, they'll try to throw out the, the, the strontium as much as possible. But plants don't care. And so as you go up the trophic pyramid, I know you get, you get higher and higher and higher levels of, of calcium to strontium ratios in vertebrate bones so that plant eaters have a lot of strontium and then the things that eat the gazelles have less strontium because they've eaten, you know, they're filtering out the, the, the residue in the gazelles. Does that have implications for bone development or for the strength of bone or the, the presence of strontium versus calcium in the diet? No idea. But certainly the kinds of things that you see in modern people um, as a result of not having enough calcium are things that you don't see in the fossil record, right? So these like rickets and But you, but you see enamel hypoplasias. Yeah. But that's supposedly weaning phenomena, not sort of overall diet stuff. A lot of fruits do not have, are high in calcium, like figs actually are quite high in calcium. Let's see, just in the front. Um, how do you think that the Australopithecines were avoiding predators? Uh, we've talked about the fact that they might not have been really good at running or that they might not have been climbing trees. And I, I can't really argue for them climbing trees if they have such helpless infants, which we've also been talking about. That seems kind of almost impossible, regardless of their anatomy. So if they're not good at running, how are they surviving? Um, they weren't. That's why they're not around it. <laughs> no, um, I, I think 
I think regardless of the kinematics that they were using in bipedal locomotion, I still think there's pretty compelling evidence that they're, they're good climbers. Um, the upper limbs, I can certainly say this for the South African material, Australopithecus africanus and Sediba have, you know, upper limbs which look like they're, they're very well adapted for climbing. And I think that that's at least the, a predator avoidance response, that, um, you know, maybe they're exploiting more open country, maybe they're, they're using social groups and, and numbers to reduce the risk of doing that a little bit, but they probably didn't get, go all that far from trees. And um, when predators came around, they probably went up the trees. How they were managing with the young, I don't know. I don't know, any thoughts on that? Oh, it's a great Helping question. each other. Yeah. Well, I've always thought one of the first things that what might have developed in terms of tool use that you can't preserve is a sling. Mm -hmm. Because, I mean, apes take, they weave together vegetation to make a nest, put their bodies in, and it doesn't seem like too big of a stretch to think of weaving together sure. something simple to carry your baby in as mm -hmm. well, which you could climb a tree with that. Well, Pat Shipman actually argued at one point that this is why we're picking up cut mark bones beginning about 2.5 million years ago, is that one of the things that the hominins were after were the, the sinews, the, the ligaments uh, and tendons from around the joints for making carrying hmm. things, making slings and, and other devices for carrying stuff. So, right. Unfortunately, that doesn't preserve the fossil record, though. I would like to see a sling made out of tendons. <laughs> <laughs> Try it. <laughs> Challenge accepted. <laughs> OK. <laughs> see the question over here? Is it like, is it even possible for a hairless animal to like have such a large infant and carry it around all the time in a way that's not like a huge energetic constraint if they don't have a sling. Because like how else would you lose the hair unless you had something, you know, like some other way to keep your baby around? Because I feel like just like natural selection would never allow you to, to like get rid of the hair if that was the only way for the baby to hang on. But I don't think our babies could hang on to, if we, even if we had hair, I don't think that our little babies would be able to hold on the way that apes do. Well, and, well so then how would they um, lose the ability to hang on unless they were like always being carried? And how do you always carry without a sling? I'm just wondering if, if we've like looked at the, the energy constraints of carrying without a sling and whether it would be even possible Mm -hmm. There are people looking at the energy, the energetics of carrying. Um, I don't know if they've actually looked at that particular question, but I think that however it was, carrying babies took up a lot of energy. And I think it's part of the incredible investment that humans have to put into our children. I think they're asking the assumption, though, that people were it's kind of recently with that in the sort of Western scientists have been using slings. And so I think it's a good idea to try to model that because I think there has been this sort of assumption that we were just sort of carrying them in our arms. And what the people have done so far in modeling energetics of carrying has been more about that. So it'd be interesting to see how those compare looking at and also different ways you can carry your baby, different positions and what effect that might have. Well, I think the, the scenario that you're laying out is a recipe for, for shared parental care and alloparenting that it's not just on mom. Um, in that kind of scenario that you lay out of a helpless infant being carried by one individual is incredibly energetically taxing, as you say, most likely. And so being able to give the child off to other members of the group while that mother then goes and feeds um, would, be, would be beneficial to her, it'd be beneficial to her child, it'd be beneficial to the father of the infant. And, so, and I think selection would strongly favor that kind of, of social, social networking that goes on in the raising of the young. The idea that it takes a village to raise a kid could go back quite a ways um, in that kind of scenario you're laying out. And the nice thing about the scenario you're laying out is um, there are means of, of testing when this happened, of getting at that, by looking at the grasping ability of, of infant fossils, like the Dikika fossil mm -hmm. from 3.3 million years ago in Ethiopia. Uh, and then there is some really- uh, How do you look at that? Grasping ability of infant there fossils? There are toes, mm -hmm. yeah. So there's a foot of the individual that's preserved. Um, and then there's genetic evidence for, uh, uh, the, for lice lineages and looking at when body hair may have been reduced in, the, in humans 
that also points, if for those who buy the genetic data on this, that it points to about 3.4 million of the reduction of body hair. Um, so it seems to be happening around this, this time of Australopithecus. And, and actually, it isn't, I mentioned the loss of body hair, but another thing is that apes have more things to grasp with, right? They have more hair on their mothers to grasp, but they also have four grasping appendages instead of just two. Mm -hmm. Questions? Okay, Kim? Um, it was mentioned earlier that one idea was that um, you could see marks on animal bones to, um, with the intention of taking off tendons in order to use them as slings. I just think it would make more sense to take off animal hide as opposed to tendons. So are there any marks on like just bones that are very close to hides that you could use to determine if that were true or not? Yeah, so uh, you know, this isn't my argument. This was an argument that was made by Pat Shipman back in the 1980s. And I think that her argument was actually based on the distribution of cut marks, like where you find them on some of the bones, um, because you can, you can then begin to get a fix on like what the hominins were going after. And um, uh, I don't remember very well, but it may well be that she also talked about skin and mm -hmm. removing skin. Now, the problem is that you know, skin is very superficial, and most bones are deep. Not many of them are subcutaneous. A few of them sort of get there. So it may well be that, that you're just not going to pick up much evidence for removing skins. You know, if you, if you get down into the distal limb segments of an antelope, let's say, or a horse, uh, you know, the lower parts of the limbs, there, there's no meat left. It's all, it's all tendons. And if you find cut marks in those areas, you know it's not because the animals are trying to get stuff to eat. So that, that was Pat's uh, shipment's attempt to, to address that problem. All right. Well, I think we've actually reached the end of our time here. And I know that I've learned a lot. And I feel there's also lots of new areas we've talked about that are more research that has to be done. So I hope that you, many of you young people out there can have some new ideas for things you can go and research or um, fossils you can hopefully go find. Um, great questions, actually. <laughs> really good questions. And yeah, great questions as well. Um, I'd like to thank both of our speakers for coming to BU and for sharing their knowledge with us. I'd also like to uh, give some, a special acknowledgement to uh, Kay Brown for her vision to uh, start these dialogues and her hard work over the uh, to put these together and to bring these uh, to bring these to us. Thank you, Kay. Um, and I also want to thank all of you for participating, for coming, for participating, for asking questions. And following this, we'll have a reception outside, and you can get a chance to ask your questions uh, firsthand uh, with the uh, speakers here. Thank you very much.